Welcome to our space where talking about the inspiring things with inspiring people is what inspires us. Waiting for you here are the infinite possibilities that creation, collaboration and connection have to offer. A universe where we see everything through roasting the spectacles that help us to keep our faith in the power of imagination alive and well. And now, let's talk. Chat, show queen and legend, Trisha Goddard is our guest in Medralla Rosa today. Radio and TV presenter, journalist, producer, mental health advocate and activist, breast cancer survi survivor, author, runner, mother of two. She is a total hero. And she lives between the US and the UK and still had time to come and have a nice chat with us. We are not just only very honored, but very, very, we feel very lucky, honestly. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you for, for joining this conversation. Metralla Rosa is all about having inspiring chats with people that had can can offer visions yeah. from behind the scenes that maybe are not so obvious for mm -hmm. everyone and you have overcome absolutely everything not just that but with an amazing attitude and a lovely face and i can't believe your age so i need a, i'm south american sorry i care about those things so sorry i had to start saying that um you started working in tv in Australia, back in yes. Australia. Yeah. And um, you were 28 years old. That's right. Yes. Can you please tell us if that was something that happened, like an, a lucky accident, or you were very cleverly trying to do everything right to get, uh, to have your first opportunity? Wow. Well, I, when I was a little girl, when I was, um, I think about nine, I used to borrow my stepfather's camera and take photographs and he had a brownie movie camera oh, and did you so, have it? yeah well i used to borrow it and but make, still no. no no i've got but i used to make these little movies when i would have been about 13 or 14 and i entered one to young film director of the year the bbc was having a competition and i was a runner-up Oh my God. And for my prize, I got um, an editing machine. In the days, you had to scrape it with a razor blade and wow. use cement. And I, uh, you know, I did all of that. And then I thought, I'm going to enter again. And this time I did a little movie with special effects. And uh, again, I had to scrape each, you know, do everything. I played the piano. I played classical piano since I was four. So I did the soundtrack. I had to cement the you know used yes, to cement the soundtrack so to the movie and make it and i got another runner-up award and um with another little a little boy or young boy who did animation who was nick parks ended up nick parks being wallace and romick which is funny we both were finalists um on that show and so since i was nine or ten i had a passion for movies I would go to the cinema, I would watch movies over and over and over again. Um, so Carol Reed's The Fallen Idol, I was obsessed with the lighting, the storytelling. Uh, but my family situation was such, I, there wasn't money for me to go to university. So I did lots of jobs. I worked um, as a junior costumier making costumes because I love fashion. I then I worked on the hovercraft as a hovercraft hostess. I ended up being a stewardess in the Middle East during the war years as a hostess in, in Bahrain working on aircraft. Wow. And uh, yes, yeah, so I went all over the world. So when I was uh, uh, based in Bahrain flying, I would work nonstop, then put all my leave together. So I had maybe three months leave. And then I would go and do a course in television journalism mm. in, in London. I would do when everybody else, when we stopped, when we were flying and we had an overnight stop, they would all go out to the clubs or what have you. I would go and do work experience 
at a radio station or behind the scenes. So the you were a TV geek. Right <laughs> from you still the are. World, word go. From the word go. And so when I was when I was working for Gulf Air as well, I went to them and I said, look, you're in flight magazine. Can I can I write something for them? And I flew with a girl called Susie Paler and she wanted to be a photographer. She ended up being a photographer the for the Times newspaper. Wow. So we worked together, she would take photographs, I would write about it, and we did it for free for the in-flight booklet. But what that meant so was... So the, the, the world have a, haven't changed much. No, but... You still have to do all those things. You have to do those things, but I always say there's no... You get paid in other ways. I always say to mm. young people, if you're just looking for money, you're going to lose out. Mm -hmm. Because I then had a very glossy yeah, yeah. in-flight magazine. I could go to other people and say, well, look, I've been published. <laughs> no. So I came to Australia and I started working in public relations with networks. And... Um, a guy called George Demetrius, who, who was a news, uh, I beg your pardon, George Daniki, and I should get his name right, he was a news presenter. He said to me, why are you wasting your time do, doing this? You should be working in television. So I put in an application. The deadline was midnight. I got a friend to drive me there five to midnight in the night, <laughs> posted it through the door, and I got my first job in uh, uh, um, an ethnic television station in Australia called um, SBS. Mm -hmm. I ended up... It was an important TV... It was a small, small one. A small, all ethnic people on it. But when Stevie Wonder came to the uh, Australia, he insisted on having a black journalist interview him. I was the only one, so okay. I did it. Oh my God. Archbishop Desmond Tutu came. I went, I was a junior journalist, I went with a senior journalist. So I got talking to him. When Nelson Mandela was released from prison, the first overseas country he came to was Australia because Australia was supporting him greatly. And at that time, Britain wouldn't let him in, remember? When he first got out of jail, he was seen as uh, almost like a terrorist. Uh. So he went to Australia and he asked me to work with him. So I ended up, I had a brand new baby at that stage who he loved because he hadn't seen children for like 28 years behind bars. So I got to work with Nelson Mandela. Um, eventually I was hired by the ABC. Which wow, is, that's, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, ABC. yeah. yeah. Wow. He, was, he wrote a letter to my daughter, which we still have framed, yeah. um, that she was the future of the world being both black and, and white. Uh, working he, with him was was awesome, um, but you have to remember in those days he was frowned upon, so, you know, but um, I, he was so supportive of me because he could see I was... So I mean, he was really the amazing character that he was bigger so, than life and no, he was he, he was centred. Hmm. He had this power. I've met very few people in my life who don't shout, very tall, don't shout, very calm, and he was surrounded by Australian security and politicians were saying, this, this, do this, do this. And he just was like a, a rock. And when he spoke to you, it was like you were the only person in the room. And I remember these politicians trying to pull him away from talking to me. And I had my, my baby and like she was crying and, and, you know, I had a nanny with me. But I was, you know, we didn't get sick leave or, or maternity leave. And she was crying, I was like, oh, I was so embarrassed, yeah. you know, because I'm a journalist in my suit jacket and I, I, you know, I had to breastfeed and bring about, I thought, I'm sorry, like, this. he said, no, Don't he said, we'd never heard, we never used to hear babies, the babies crying or when we were in prison and he held her and, um, you know, he said, hit, hit, and, you know, he was singing to her oh. and I was, I remember I was embarrassed because my colleagues and these politicians were looking at me like, seriously, you call yourself a journalist and you bought this baby? <laughs> and he loved it. And he made me feel so good. And welcome. And yeah. welcome. And, um, you know, so th eventually I was hired by ABC television, which is like BBC. That's bigger. That, that's yeah, bigger. And that's very big. Yeah. And I didn't realise I was the first black person ever in Australian television. It being on screen, on, on, screen. Yeah. on air. I didn't, I didn't know that until the press interviewed me, my first interview, 
in a dress I borrowed from somebody else because they just called me from SBS and said, you've got the job, come now. I was in scruffy clothes. I said to my colleague, can I borrow your dress? <laughs> she get wore my clothes. I went and they said, you've got the job. They introduced me to the press. And one of the journalists said, how does it feel to be Australia's first black on screen person? And I was like, I didn't. If I, I only knew. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I because didn't it happened it. because you didn't have that consciousness. Not at all. Of any kind of discrimination. But do you think it's, it, do you feel yourself proud of uh, having that position and being able to say that you were? You were that person? Not then. Not then. Because the outcry because of it, because of the reaction in Australia because of it, suddenly I wasn't safe. Mm. I, it was suggested to me that I have security, I had radio, you know, shock jocks, calling, saying, So you were disgusting. challenging all the status quo at it, the moment? It, but I, it was just me against all these people, would ring into the network saying we don't want this expletive on the air, send her back to where she comes really? from, a KKK spread on my door. And when I drove, when my boyfriend drove, I had to hide down on the floor of the car. I'd go to my gym, journalists would come into the gym. I was, I was a journalist. I was not used to being the news. Um, I just wanted to be a journalist. And suddenly it was all about my colour. And, you know, I, I found that really difficult. But the ratings were really high because of it. Because so. of it, yeah. It has always a good and a bad side. Yeah, yeah. But definitely uh, to be able to open as a woman, as a woman, is so important to feel like, okay, uh, now we are putting the barriers a little bit yeah, further yeah. down because yeah. we, 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 because I did this, I, yeah. I feel, I imagine that feels very good at this point, maybe Ooh. not that well, I, even the they, they haven't advanced very much. And in fact, really? I, I, yeah, I did an interview just a few days ago with Australian television about racism and, and Meghan Markle and the lack of diversity in print in, in, in Britain. And I said, because it was an Australian journalist, hey, it's even worse in Australia. You know, I, I still, I, I, I mentor people of, young people of colour in Australia who grew up watching me and have, that's the good thing wow. because they watched me they said I'm going to do it that I want to do it. That sounds very ridiculous at these days but, yep. well, but it's, yep. the, 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 the war is still what it is. Um, being, you have both, uh, you are both British and Australian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you feel because of your family, because of your Childhood? Did you feel more Australian or not? Or not necessarily? No, well, my children. Well, you were born here. I was born in England. I have on my stepfather's side. I had aunts and uncles in Australia, um, uh, but I wasn't really particularly particularly close to them. My grandmother, I was. My grandmother was in Australia, and she was dual as well. Um, my children were born Australian. I. I've never felt any particular nationality, yeah, I, but feel all nationalities. I, I know. Kind of guess that. Yeah, people say I'm to me. You. Yeah, people say to me, which country, which country do you love the most mm. that you've lived in? I say I love the Middle East. I mean, I learned to speak Arabic. I love the Middle Eastern culture. I studied Islam out of interest, uh, and I have a Jewish boyfriend. I love Australia. I love Britain and I love the part of the United States, you know, I love New England. Uh, there are so many countries I, I love and people are all the same. It's, we all have the same fears and hopes and, and what have you. I, I can pick five things I love out of every country and five things I hate. Uh, yeah. So to me... Deciding that one country is the best country in the Actually, whole world is stupid. Actually, you're now living in the US, and I'm you US. also said that you feel super comfortable. You have lots of friends, and yeah. you love it there. Yeah. So it's it's probably more about what you are doing. Your it life is, is always um, about what you are doing at the moment, and if, yeah. it, if yeah. you yeah. feel yeah. very engaged with that, you feel alive and, and That's perfectly true. fine. That's very true. Um, when when was the first opportunity in TV in UK and when did you start doing chat shows? Well, 
Because uh, you are very well known that, because yeah, of for, that. For chat shows. Well, in Australia, I started in, in news and current affairs, I always did social welfare issues. And I've been, because of my, my youngest sister committed suicide after a long battle of, uh, with schizophrenia, and uh, an amazing journalist called Anne Deverson was the only person who reached out to me and, um, you know, and, and admired the work that I was doing and said, you know what, come and be a spokesperson, come and advise the government. And I was a government advisor um, for 10 years, two government advisors. So I, I started introducing a lot of mental health um, into my, my TV shows. Mm -hmm. And people who had never talked about their mental health battles started talking to me. Mm -hmm. So my bosses were like, oh, okay, let's cover mental health, you know. So gradually, I, I, when I had my, my daughter, I couldn't do nightly news. I just couldn't anymore, you know. So they asked me to do a um, health... Because it was daily? Why you couldn't do it? It was every it? night because live, yeah. every night live. I... During the Tiananmen uh, Square, during the uh, Berlin Wall coming down, I was sleeping in the newsroom on a camp bed, pregnant. Yeah. I mean, I, I was on there two hours after I had my, my daughter. Make you couldn't control everything. less the, the, the condition. No, so it no, was much harder. Yeah. And, and it was just, you know, yeah. it was too difficult. So they offered me, they said, what show do you want to do? So I said, I want to do health and social welfare. So I did a health and social welfare show, and then from that I formed my own production company. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do the same thing, but with an audience, and, and with so people. they can with people, so they can ask the experts that I interview will be there to answer their questions. So twice a week we did uh, sex and relationships, which was really out there at the time. We did health. We did. We staged. One time, a huge car crash outside. We did it as an outside broadcast. We got film crews to stage that had been an ac accident. The audience didn't know. We ran outside the studio to the stage accident with people. Uh, what would you do if you came across this? And we used audience members directed wow. by ambulance staff. Use your umbrella to, for a splint and show people how to do it. So somehow it was also very educational. Oh, well, it was yeah. completely, always yeah, educational. Always, yeah. Even if we did going on holiday, it was about health and in inoculations and things like that. And um, I was always very honest about my, my situation. If we did dealing with divorce, dealing with death, whatever. And so um, someone in the UK saw a tape of it and said... Um, this left a message on my answering machine. You don't know, who, I, I kid you not, it's like, you don't know who I am. I've never been to Australia before, but I'm coming over there. I want to meet you and I'm going to make you a star. I was like, oh, another one. <laughs> another of those offers. No. <laughs> Seriously. And it was a guy called You Mark. didn't believe it. No, oh, but no. they followed it up. Not even a deep inside. No, I was like, oh yeah, right. I'm going to make you a star, like, you know, Hollywood. And yeah, yeah, right. You know, I'm a journalist. Uh, it was a, a, a gentleman called Malcolm Olsop, who worked with Anglia in England, which was part of, Anglia TV was part of ITV. He flew to Australia for the very first time. We went to a place called Siebel Townhouse, which was where all the rock and rollers used to stay. He sat down, talked to me, and he said, yeah. It's you. Yeah, he said, it's you. Um, and I came out of there like, he took pictures. He said, I've got to show people. Oh, you look fantastic. I love your show. I love this. I love that. And I said, which bits? He said, I like it with your honesty when you talk about your divorce or, you know, about your sis sister's death. We need a talk show host mm -hmm. who has been to the mountain, we say. You know, who's... who's lived yeah that people respect because of that and also it gives you a some sort of um like you were saying about mandela a center because you yeah. have been there you know yeah. what you're talking about yeah. you are not just making it off you, you are not just a fragile person saying oh my god how a person can go through all yeah, that yeah. because you yeah. have been there yeah. so you can be even uh, more more um, Connect. Helpful. 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 And, and connected. Yeah. And, and yeah. quite really. Yeah. And, and really, and all the mental health work that I've done, I, um, because I was dealing with a, a very painful 
situations. I'd done training courses, I did conflict resolution, I trained in, in that while I was doing journalism and mental health and conflict resolution. And all my life, I've, if I find there's somewhere lacking, I'll go and do a course. So I'll, mm. I'll go to someone and say, teach me this or teach me that. So I had actually a lot of, of training in mental health, in, um, you know, talking and working with people with mental health issues. So he said that and um, I landed in England on um, the Friday. I had Saturday and Sunday off. It was bank holiday Monday on the Monday. Tuesday, I started my show and I did it until I left the UK in 2000, well, 2008, well, to not my breast wow. cancer. Wow, and you were already the mother of two. Yeah, I brought so them. You, <laughs> have to, you have to change their lives somehow and yours as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And your husband at the moment was yeah. happy to come here or he stayed there? You know, he was happy at that time okay. too, and he was a new husband as well. So we all relocated to Norfolk, where Anglia Television was based. And my children and where you had still a house there i you? just sold that house okay. now i yeah but i had a house there and my children went to school there and my then husband was um uh, ran mind the mental health charity yeah. in, in norfolk so i've still carried on my mental health work i've always carried on my mental health work and uh and and did the talk show as well and i introduced in exactly the same thing uh, it was a tabloid show. I very rarely mentioned the word mental health, but it was always, always there. Um, we had one counsellor when I joined the show. I recruited, I had another two counsellors. I had mental health organisations come in and teach and work with the staff. So gradually... Yeah, you really wanted to do a good job. We wanted to turn it around so it was more about the people. Did you think that because you were also producing those programs or behind the scenes, mm -hmm. uh, taking decisions, important decisions, you could do that? Oh, yeah. As a presenter, how much power do you have to really change a structure, or a TV structure that you maybe feel that you should improve or you are not completely happy? Have you, do you have the same power? Yes, but most presenters don't realise that. Or they don't care, maybe. They either don't care, or they either don't care, or they don't realise it. But I've always said, once the red light goes on... It's my it's show. <laughs> <laughs> it's my show. It's my show. <laughs> and you bring to the show who you are. If there is nothing behind you, then that's unfortunately how your show is going to be. Yeah. Um, if you come, remember I was 40, well I was 27 when I started in television, by the time I started my, my chat show, I was uh, 41, I had lost my sister to suicide, I'd had a, a breakdown myself and been yeah. in a psychiatric hospital myself, I had given birth twice, had babies, I had been you divorced, moved countries, moved countries. I'd had a, a husband. You were the first black, first black senator. <laughs> I, I had worked in the Middle East during the war, during conflict. I'd lost friends during, you know, a, in a war situation. So, of course, I can't help but bring all of that, you know. When you had the breakdown after you were already very involved in the mental health yeah. issues and you care a lot about that, and after we we was the name of yeah, your my sister, sister. Yeah, my sister. Yeah. Um, that she committed suicide in such a brutal way. Yeah, because yeah. schizophrenia, we all should know if we don't that it's a it, it's a illness that really makes suffer the people that carry it yeah. in a way that seems horrible for everyone around and probably yeah. it's horrible and, for themselves and often not dealt with by health services in the best way it's, okay. it's difficult yeah, yeah. How, when you had your i would like to know because mm -hmm. it, it is mm -hmm. kind of long but you had that experience you got involved in all these things and then you had your yeah. own breakdown yeah. was it easy for you you yeah. thought you were you, you, it wasn't yeah, going to happen No, to you. you think it's somebody else. Yeah, yeah. it was really difficult. Um, and I think the reason I got to the stage of actually having a breakdown is because I always saw it as someone else, not mm. me. And Such a uh, good lesson, right? Absolutely. And um, I still couldn't believe it when I was in the hospital. And, you know, 
it was linked with, and I still think in many cases it still is linked with a lot of shame. So I was ashamed. And then they had a phone call to the ward and they said to me, oh, there's a phone call for you. And it was a journalist saying, oh, we found out that you're in a psychiatric hospital. We want to do, you know, we want to do a story. And I was so ill. I was so terrified. And then I was hysteric. I was upset. And of course, doctors were like, oh, she's hysterical. You know, it was my, and my natural reaction. Every reaction I had was seen as a was symptom on of my their, illness. On, yeah. And it was like, you know, uh, I had was the same reaction. examination, everything, everything. Everything. And I had the same reaction when, when I had breast cancer much later and journalists found out. I was just hysterical, but nobody said to me, you're mad. Everyone said, you yeah, know, you're like, right. You're right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, <clears throat> No, I, I remember as well when I came out of hospital, um, no, my colleagues wouldn't look at me, you know, there was like, nobody spoke about the fact that I had been away from work, um, it wasn't talked about, I couldn't even really talk to my parents about it, you know, um, my parents and I never very, I think, hardly ever discussed it. Really? I don't think, we, I don't recall that we did, it was just shame 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 and um i remember i went to the first meeting with the rest of the advisory mental health advisory group and it was made up of people who had mental illnesses and their families and i sat there and i still had all this shame and then um this one chap simon champ who um again ann deverson had introduced me to him a long time before he had schizophrenia and he he, he sat there and he said well, I guess you'll be able to hear the voices too. And we all started laughing and that was it. Yeah. And it was great. I suddenly realised they could... And, and they supported me. People with mental illness that I helped before, they came and they supported me. And it switched the whole, the whole dynamic. And then when they were ill, I would go and sit with them in hospital. Mm -hmm. So it gave me a whole new network of people and changed it from me feeling I was being altruistic and helping them to hey, so we're all in this together. Yeah, 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 kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, Even I can Even if help you do you. it with the best of yeah. intentions, yeah. If, if you never see yourself as someone that can be yeah. there, it, it doesn't help with, to bring, break down that stigma that mental health. No, you. no, it, but suddenly it was a camaraderie, you know, it yeah. was, it was, and it made us much stronger as a group. It made meetings go more quickly because I could understand on so many different levels things that I'd never thought of before, like clothing and appearance. And I noticed that the people who had had mental illness um, were in my, my advisory group were almost subconsciously dressing more scruffy. Mm -hmm. And the people who had not had mental illness were overdressing to look smart. And I said, I, 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 I was very interested in appearance. And I said, this is about balance, that the people who'd had mental illness, they, want saw, them, they saw themselves as less. Mm. And the people who hadn't saw themselves as more. And because I was in both situations, I realized that I, my, I was dressing smart casual, if you like. And I started talking about that, about how we create divisions uh, between ourselves as groups. I, I now do it with companies. I did it recently with a big organisation, Burton's Biscuits, talking about mental health and how we send unconscious signals to each other. Now that you, you know. mentioned that, the, I, I read ages ago about a stu studio uh, some scientists did in a in a little town after war, after a very traumatic experience. And they were, one of the first things they were working with the, lay, the, the women that were sur yeah. survivors was trying to make them to put lipstick on, the, on their yeah. lips. And just that was a whole situation yeah. to improve yeah. their lives. But that makes you somehow see yourself first Yes. And the action of taking care of you somehow oh, really important. is really, really important. Really and important. connecting you with that careness. Well, that's yeah. what the, the, the people in the group, the, um, 
who had had mental illness. You're absolutely right. It was a, an indication of their a, a belief that they weren't worth their self yeah. Whereas the ones who hadn't had mental health problems or did and weren't talking about them were saying, I'm in control, I'm in charge, look how smart I am, and denying their vulnerability. So once I, it's so interesting, we brought it up in a meeting, the next meeting, everybody was... It was, it was so different. Yeah, it, because, because you get conscious of something. Yeah, something yeah. New. And in your specific case, what did you... What, what were you feeling? Because I know um, you were working even harder than ever, yeah. and you were coming through situations. And I have the theory, because these days it's easy to have this theory, because it's all um, the mental health... Yeah. Yeah is m more in the public yeah yeah uh, in the news everywhere is aware everywhere is interested mm -hmm. somehow and more people talk about these things so i feel like one of the things that he doesn't help is to know not not going on or accepting your emotions oh gosh yeah. if you don't go through what you feel when you feel it it creates Oh yeah, like baggages. Yeah, that sooner so or later, they create these bombs that we can call breakdown or yeah, whatever. Yeah, and in a society like this one, that you were telling me that people after they weren't even looking at you <laughs> or, or asking you yeah. because it, it, everyone finds so difficult to deal with emotions. It's so yeah. shameful if you cry in front of someone. Oh, yeah. if you feel. Yeah. If you feel moved by something, it could even be a good thing. But yeah. but an over top reaction is not a good thing to have in front of yeah, yeah, the yeah. Do you think that that's part of the problem? We are creating societies that are one step all the time from being good to being men. to going over the yeah. edge. I I think I think that uh, I'd agree with a, a lot of that, and I'd add to that that if you're a woman in control, I was running a production company, I had a staff, a, a big staff, um, children. and uh, pregnant at one stage, children and what have you, you have to look more in control than a man would be. You know, as a woman, you running those organizations. Well, you always have to prove. You something. always have to prove. You're not allowed to show any emotions except strength. And then you're bitch mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and you're you're labeled that a man can be firm and a good uh, you know a firm boss a woman's being a bitch you know so you're you're doing all of this um i was the major wage earner i was breastfeeding baby you know, all of this somehow you were not dealing with your I didn't emotion have, didn't have time and my youngest daughter seven weeks at seven weeks old was so seriously ill they you know she was in um, intensive care. I had to be there with her. I never got out of my nighty because I had to breastfeed her and I tried to go to the shower and beep 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 the alarm would go off and I'd see the crash team running the doctors. I'd run back you know and and I was <gasps> like that for all of that for it was four nights you know three um uh, yeah four days three nights of of that non-stop sleeping by, uh, you know, on, on the floor. She was on a bed in a Moses basket. It was like... And you were still working. I Well, I'd go outside on my phone and do it, and so I could look in through the window. The nurse would come and sit with her. And I breastfeed. I had to breastfeed her opposite the nurse's station so they could see if anything happened. And people were coming past and going, oh, that's the lady from the TV. Can I have your autograph? And I would just be... I would just want to scream. Yeah, so overwhelmed. Scream. Uh, I would, people, they didn't care about my distress, about my, my, my baby with a, you know, a mask on and the drips. They just wanted, can we take a photograph with you? I was in my nighty. I, I could not even get to the shower to, yeah. and they just, you know, and I, it, it, upset me it angered me um you know it, it i wasn't a person you know i wasn't a person or anything like that and uh then i found out my husband at the time was also having an affair so, so on top of everything, so, uh, everything mm -hmm. I, I found out yeah i just went you know i just completely fell apart and um 
you know, in hindsight, it was the best thing for me because uh, before they let me leave hospital, I had to sign to have a lot of therapy and I had to learn a different way to be. You know, I had to learn for my life, for my children. I had to learn. What did you learn? I learned that I had picked up a lot of unhealthy coping mechanisms as a child. My father, I mean, I'm reconciled, my stepfather, I'm reconciled with him now because I understand, but I wasn't his child. He had been led to believe I was his child. I wasn't his child. He would beat me and I learned just to go somewhere else in my head. So I didn't feel anything, you know, I, I still can run 10 kilometers I don't feel anything. People say, you know, I, I skate, I fall down. I can completely remove myself from pain because as a child, I had to, su to survive. I left home as soon as I could. So that's what I kept doing. If something hurt me, I wouldn't feel it. Mm. But like, you, you are absolutely right. It's like sweeping dust under the carpet. It gets to the point where you can't climb over the carpet. Especially if life has good plans for you, they need you. They need you to clean them. Yeah, 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 better care of yourself yeah. in every way not just working 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 oh, i'm yeah. not just this professional successful woman i'm, I'm also someone that have needs and if oh, i feel yeah. scared if i feel emotional i i should take care of that absolutely. as well because absolutely. you need to do it nobody's gonna do it for no, you. no absolutely i i mean for me running i do mindful running and I, again i'm learning all the time i only learned that when I was going through breast cancer and I didn't think I was going to survive. And I remember um, my, my husband said, you know, really, you want to go running? It's snowing. And I remember feeling this, it was stinging my face. And I thought, I'm alive. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm alive now. Yeah. So from that time on, and because I was going through chemotherapy, right, I couldn't just <clears throat> run, run fast. What's my time? How fast am I going? I had to keep stopping. And so... I would look around and feel things. It's like a meditation for you. Oh, it's, I have to have the right music. I love music, but I have to smell the rain on the leaves or the, everything. For me, um, you know, people say, oh, you like to keep fit. It's not about that. It really isn't because I can't do it on a treadmill. It doesn't work for me in a gym. Okay. It does so, not work for me in a gym. I need you the, need to feel connected with nature, I with, have with to life. Feel, with I have to. I hike. I go uh, and live near the water. I kayak. I see the deer. I like what the wildlife. Um, so sometimes do you run without shoes or, or? No, I wish I could do that. <laughs> I'd get tick bites, but no, I, I. Depending of where, but well, I, where, but I. It's more hiking and just being with nature. You mm -hmm. know, um, that's important for me. Um, another thing that's important for me is uh, when I first went to the states, the NBC would give me limos, cars everywhere. But, and I thought, oh, it's happening again. I'm becoming more and more isolated from people. And I had to convince them <laughs> I'm going by train. Yeah. And my personal assistant and everyone were like, because Jerry Springer, Maury, the other ones in the studio, they were going by private jet. I said, no, we're going by train. <laughs> yeah, I need, I need to feel how I... <laughs> my, yes. my staff were like, at first they were like, you just want to make everything more complicated. Yes. <laughs> you know, normally at this time, we would be at the airport boarding the private jet. Well, oh, you're boarding the train now. <laughs> and they, they actually, in the end, they really liked it. We used to have such a laugh. And, and they, they were American. Because we were going by train, they were seeing America, not just flying over it. You know, so they got something out of it. Um... So I, and, and I go on the train and I go on the tube and, you know, people go, oh, big deal. But trust me, 
when networks have to insure you, it makes them very nervous. But now I learned to, to fight for that, you know? And between pro, uh, doing chat shows in UK, in the UK or in the US, um, do you find a difference? No, people no? are the same. I don't care where you go. You say the word relationship, death, happiness, people are the same. The only difference is the way uh, the way they express themselves. Yeah, and the companies are not different? The productions are, are different? I think because I came to, when I came to the, do my US show, I was, what, 52, and I'm known as a producer and I've created mm. programs that I, I don't know, I turn it around the way you want the way, it. And I still, people who I've personally trained in the UK and the US, it's weird, they met up in the US, like on the Dr. Phil show, I've got like four or five of my staff I've personally trained, two from England, three from the US, and they end up working together. And I have ways of working, uh, methods of working which aren't traditional. Like, like what, for example? Like um, encouraging staff to do mental health first aid. Okay. So they understand so they themselves prepared. and their guests. Yeah. And they respect, I guess. The and, whole... and, and they understand. Mm. And, and from the point of journalists, they can ask questions that go beneath the layer, but being respectful. Also, the, I have something called the Trisha questions. So everybody, and um, it was funny. In the US, this two people I trained, um, Alison and uh, uh, I always call her Castores, that's her surname, but they were talking and they said, oh, have you asked the guests the Trisha questions? And from the next desk, someone called Carl Newton, who I trained in Norwich, this is in the States at Dr. Phil, said, the Trisha questions? Do you know the Trisha questions? And they said, how do you know the Trisha questions? And it's because I train them to ask guests a profile of questions which has nothing to do with the subject mm -hmm. that gives... The, they relax and then they they relax but not just but they give you their val their, their their values you could say to someone i don't know uh, what do you like to eat and someone could say french fries french fries well, at the end of it when you say you ask the trisha questions you may discover that the reason they ate french fries was because when they were children they could never eat out and they used to go past mcdonald's and always dream of eating french fries and they were so poor that they said one day when i have enough money i will eat french fries so there you have from an answer of just french fries a whole thing about poverty the childhood the dreams just to eat well mm. you know you have something that that person is thinking of your french fries or you can say you know um What's the, one of them is, would be like, uh, what's the worst, three worst things that ever happened to you? And people would just say this, 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 and this. It may have nothing to do with the subject, but suddenly you'll realise that the reason they feel this way about this person is because of these three worst things. You know, I lost my mum when I was a kid. Um, even though, like, let's say my dog got run over and I wasn't allowed to have another dog and I was thrown out of my home when I was 15. But that's not even the subject that you're discussing. But it will give you a framework. Mm -hmm. A story. Uh, 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 give you a framework on which you can put their answers about what they like to eat, who they're going out with. You can think. You, know, them that, as, you know as a yeah, person. As a person, yeah. yeah. And what are the three worst things that never happened to you? That, that, <laughs> ever, that, that did happen to me. Oh, I don't know if I could pick three worst things. I, I, that's, a, that's a really good one. Um, I'm very good. I've learned to reframe things. So they, the worst things, but they're also, in hindsight, the best things. I didn't know it then. Um, I would say, um, oh gosh, so many. My sister killing herself. Subsequently, that made me get involved in mental health and I'd like to think I'd done some good. I've worked with the World Psychiatric Association, worked all over the world, China, I've worked in for mental health. Um, so I hope I've 
done something in her memory. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I would say, um, gosh, I wouldn't say having a breakdown because that was necessary. Um, but you hated it when you I happened. hated it at the time, but again, I had to start again. Um, breast cancer, I'd say. Mm. Um, Did you fail when, when, or do you want to say any, any, any other horrible thing? Oh, there's lots, quite a lot of them, but I'd say those, those things stand out, yeah. When you had breast cancer, um, coming back to the, the vision we have about illness, yeah. somehow you feel that, why me? <laughs> why me? I'm, I'm healthy, I'm good with everyone, because with the mental issues, we always feel responsible somehow. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. why it's so, so shameful. Yeah. But with the other, when at the end, many of them are also because of the same, our psychology, our yeah. mental issues creates these well, situations know, in our body. But you know, but it's, it's a funny thing. By the time I got breast cancer, I thought, yeah, well, someone's got to be a statistic. I was one in four with mental fell. health. I, I thought, why yeah, not why? me? I, no, I thought, why not me? Mm. Because of my previous experience, you know, I never thought I'd have a mental breakdown. I did. I never thought I'd get divorced once, let alone three times. I did. You know, I was like, hmm, well, figures. Why not me? Someone's got to be a statistic. That's mm. why I always say someone's got to be a, st a statistic. Um, <laughs> And something really interesting that, that you say. Now, the language, the language around mental illness is suffered. You feel like a failure. There's shame. You know, you, you feel... You people, should control it. You should control it. You should pick yourself up. You're lazy. Mm -hmm. You're this. You're moody. You're, you're, you know, you're making everyone feel bad. The language is very negative. You are selfish. Selfish. You care about the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With breast cancer, you're a hero. You're fighting. You're this. You have <clears throat> balls. People wear big dresses. People come and hug you and like this. When they're, you have flowers, my my um, room in the hospital when I had breast cancer was like a florist. There were so many flowers. I had to send them to the children's wards. My room when I had a breakdown, nothing. Nothing, not a card, nothing, not a phone call, nothing. Wow, and do you still, you, you think it's still like, like that? Yeah, because I, I don't like the language associated with breast cancer because it says fight, she won her battle against breast cancer, she lost her, her battle. Like, you lost, you, it's not your fault, yeah. you know, like you're weak, you if you'd been stronger you would have fought and won. And it's very male uh, war. War is used in the war against yeah, cancer, yeah, yeah. battling, yeah. fighting, and it makes you feel that you you are weak if you don't win that. It also, if you're battling and you're brave, how do you get to show that you're falling apart, that you're angry, that you want to shout at your, your God, that you, you're scared? When people keep saying you're brave, yeah. you don't feel you can do that. You, 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 you shut that somebody down. Point, everyone. Yeah, you shut somebody's real emotions down. You know, I can't cry because everybody's saying I'm brave. So I, I, I'm really fascinated with the language that we use around illness. Um, and that breast cancer has been made into, you know, people run marathons and they have the pink ball, pink ribbon ball. Nothing like that for mental health. Nothing like that. And you can really tell because you were... I've been in both there. places. <clears throat> You know, people say, is this the worst thing that ever happened to you, breast cancer? I said, no, my breakdown was worse because with breast cancer, I'm a so hero. But people want to talk about that. Yes, but let's talk about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you're a hero. <laughs> no, but let's oh my God, that. you're amazing. Nobody says that about, and trust me, it's much, much harder. When you've got breast cancer, all the doctors are working on you. With mental illness, it's you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, whatever doctor's pills they give you, in the end, you have to do the work. Breast cancer, you can do all the work you like, it will help a bit, but ultimately it's medicine. And how the experience of uh, the breakdown help with the breast cancer oh. when, when it happened? Because you already were working in some things that I, I guess yeah. helped to 
come across the the other situation. Oh gosh, yes. which one were, were those things that you you were already implementing in yeah. your day to day life? Well, my 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 running, because I worked all the way through chemotherapy, radiotherapy, everything. I worked through it um, because I need that was my coping thing. I don't do vict I don't like to do victim mm. because it's bad for me. If I start feeling like a victim, it's it's not good for me. I go right down. So I learned mindful running. Um, I learned to say no mm. instead of, yeah, okay, I'll do that, I'll do that. I learned to be... Um, Stronger about boundaries? Where, where, where... Slightly, not strong enough, but took a step in the right direction. I got rid of... There were friendships and relationships that I had. There's nothing like the threat of death to think, you know what? <laughs> I have to clean up here. You know, I'm only going to do what I want to do. I'm only going to be around someone I really need to be around, especially if you don't know how long you're going to be around. Alive. alive. Yeah, let's be and honest. And we, we don't know. We don't know. We don't <laughs> so know. That should um, be always a priority. Always. And every mm -hmm. year, like every year I go back to Norfolk, I have all my breast cancer checked. I have everything because I had a, a very aggressive uh, cancer, much more aggressive than I realised, thank God, that I didn't know at the time. But um, every time I go back, it's traumatic, but it's connecting. I have all my tests on the same day uh, at the hospital. I space them out and in between every test, I go across to the woods and I run around the woods and I get muddy, I don't care if it's raining, I connect. And then I come back for the next test and I make them give me all my results then because I've always said if anything came back negative, I'm there in the hospital, I'm staying there. Okay. <laughs> and and the, your, your mental disposition, it's also more positive mm. or do, do you think that that's irrelevant? No, 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 <clears throat> it's not irrelevant. My, my mental health. Um, I, I the changing a little bit the way you talk with yourself, the that dialogue you have with yourself. Yeah. Has has it changed? Since? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It has. In which I, way? I shut it down sometimes. Sometimes you have to say to yourself, "Shut up." <laughs> yeah. At night. Are you <laughs> making me crazy. Yeah, yeah. Just, <clears throat> okay, shut up. I use music a lot, but I not just any music. I use music to access my moods let me explain it this way when i was going through breast cancer i don't know how i came up with it but i really got into watching movies scary 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 movies stupid happy movies because scary movies i could go <gasps> and be frightened and, and, and let it out let or it out. laugh yeah. i could yeah. love or I sad movies with the, with the music. Cry. Yeah, I could cry at the scare. And, and so I use music now the same way to, to get it out. If I'm happy, um, you know, I'll dance. You know, my, my ex-husband used to say, everybody's watching you. That's something. I, when I'm running, I'm dancing. He said, everybody's watching you. They think you're stupid. And I say, how do you know what they think? Yeah, I and think why would think I care? Wonderful. <laughs> I think, you know, it's basically, I'm alive. So yeah. hell, I'm gonna do what the hell I want, you know. Are you all the time scared about the, having it again, the cancer? No, because uh, only when the tests come up, because I have to confront that. Um, What's your routine? What do you have to do to take care of yourself now? Well, they, they kept me on drugs for 10 years and unfortunately it had an effect on my eyes. So I've kind of been a bit preoccupied fighting my, keep my eyesight. Yeah. I had a couple of operations on my eyes and I, the thing is I will not know if I'm losing my eyesight because your brain adjusts. Okay. So okay. they test that, I'm gonna get my eyes tested. That's probably more frightening then cancer coming back because I, I love I mean my work is seeing and observing um, but I've just done this dancing on ice and uh, competition and one of the competitors Libby Clegg is blind and is skating and I thank you the gods that she came along because I was like I've fallen into that belief that if you're blind you know that would kind of be over it. Now I see Libby and what she can do and how she says to, she's being taught to ice skate from scratch and she's saying, let me listen to your blades. 
you know? And so I was on the ice with my instructor, and I was like, you know, I, so you meet people who change your view of what to be frightened of. So am I frightened of my cancer coming back? I, look, if it, no. no, because no. if it happens, it happens. Yeah. And I, it won't be as scary as the first time. That some anticipations are good, some others no. are not worth it. Yeah. No, I'd be I more get, frightened of having that. another breakdown. Okay. Because it takes, it took me, it took me 10 years of drugs to get through breast cancer treatment. Uh, a breakdown, it was two years of therapy, really. But it really takes all your life it's to be exhaust. in a good mental health. It, yeah. it affects everything, <clears throat> your work. I mean, running, I was a single mum. I had one baby in the stroller, one on my backpack. I walked every day. I couldn't look at people, but I would go walking every day and gradually people would say, hello, like this, yeah, hello. Because they saw me every day. And then in the end, they'd stop and talk to the children. And then I'd talk to them. And then I stopped being isolated in, in my head. And I had this community. So I needed to go for that walk, not just for exercise to lift my mood, but to connect with people. So one of the reasons that between my breast cancer checks that I run in the park, I still see the same people I used to see when I used to run with my dogs. And it's somehow it's, it, 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 for me, if a it's familiar. It's familiar, it's familiar, yeah. yeah. And you, you wrote in, in an article about depression, something that I would like to, you said, depression doesn't hear or see love. It doesn't let itself to reason and it is often the master of disguise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you also, the, the problem is that nobody can really do much because if they want to show you how amazing you are, how worth it life is, how much they love and love you and care about you. It doesn't get through. It doesn't get through. How do you work with, uh, with that? To come to overcome depression, really. Well, I think it's easy to say. It's, it's easy, easy to say. It's easy to talk about, but no, you you take things one tiny step at a time, at a time. and you set yourself goals. Not, I want to get better. That's too far. Mm. It might be what I used to do is give people a plant, a pot plant and say, do me a favor, can you look after that for me? So just looking after the plant, and then if you visit them and the plant's wilting, you know that they're not well, rather than how are you? It's doing little things like, I, I mentor people online doing this. People just say, you're lucky, you can go running. And I'd say, where do you live? And I'd Google where they live. What's that up there? I don't know, can you show me? Just take a photograph. So they go up 200 yards, take a photograph. What's round there? A I mean, little bit further. Yeah, and, and I've got <laughs> lots of- on the other tree. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of other people online. There's a lady, Shazbat, who had breast That's cancer. That's super clever. Well, Shaz, I don't know her real name, Shazbat. She had breast cancer, and had depression, because you, you get mental health problems with any life-threatening disease. And she said, on my Instagram, oh, you're so lucky you can do this. And I said, well, you could be lucky too. You know, do you have a pair of trainer sneakers? Yeah, where do you live? I Googled it, what's there, what's there, what's there? And I kept pushing her. Two years it's been now, she just ran the Great Northern Marathon. Wow. And she helps me with other people. I tag, Shazbat, what would you, I don't know what her real name is. What, she's joined a running group. So. Shazbat, can you help me out with so-and-so? Where are you? There's a lady in Brighton. There's another lady, Laura, who's got bowel cancer, who's been treated for bowel cancer in Wales. So we contact them and we say, can you just show us what's there, what's there? And then when they're on their feet, they help someone else. And then we you show them. You create a chain. A of chain. Work. And then we show them. If and they sink down again, they want everyone like, Hi, we're here. Why do you care about me? Because you cared about me when I was down, you know? So I'd say if you're depressed, find a good connection on 
social media a good connection mind the mental health charity has a fantastic yeah website. but one that helps you to get out of your house because yeah, the yeah. problem with social media and we can see it in new generations is that they create this reality that they feel connected ah. but it's not but the, uh, that's there's why nothing. i say there's good ones good, 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 good ones ones um, that are helpful a lot of the fitness ones not all of them um that some that i follow tend to be good. they tend to be good and they're keyed in they're people who've had mental health problems themselves um it's interesting because i can think of two fitness ones that i joined and i asked the right question and now they're talking about their mental health mm. and they include it in their workouts and sometimes it's workouts in the house and they do it come on do it with me so you can prop it up and it might be breathing exercises just to start with. Yeah, just to connect with yourself. Just to connect, yeah. Do you meditate? I'm terrible at meditating. My boyfriend's really good at meditating. My meditation is running because <laughs> yeah. it really is. Because it's difficult for you to be still. It is. I think if I was in school now, I would be diagnosed with ADHD. <laughs> I, I really do. I really do. <laughs> well, thank we, we We are all happy about that. Um, I know that because you you went to a program uh, Lose Women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were saying that uh, when you met your actual boyfriend, which is someone very important in your life, yeah. but you keep the identity. Oh secret, yeah. <laughs> you were still already separated, but yeah. still in the process of getting officially yeah. divorced, and you wouldn't have done anything oh, with no. that man, like no. not even a kiss or anything. Yeah, no. Um, but but he, you, you things were clear, and he had an affair. So I am. Um, oh my, my ex yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you very stubborn? Is it? Are you very, are you very old fashioned? Why, why, why was that? Decision? I'm really old. <laughs> I'm really old fashioned. Um, because everything no, is, I, I, I believe. I believe that. If I vow to do something, not just marriage, if I vow to do something, mm. if I don't stick to that vow, I am devaluing myself. Mm. I, you know, I, I, I just, I don't know. I just, it's a line I cannot cross. Yes. I don't want to cross it. It's too much. It's too much for your head. I could not have an affair. It's too much for your, I always say, if you try to eat that person's meal and your meal at the same time, the only thing you'll end up with is belly ache. Yes. You know, it, it's too complicated. And what I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of that. And what you do to someone's self-esteem and everything else, to me, it's, it's not worth it. So, but, you know, with... With my... I mean, I, I, with my boyfriend now, it's, it's funny. Because while I was on my own, I was on my own for quite a while. And I, if you like, put out there, I said to myself, my next, whoever I date next, this is going to sound awful, will have lost a partner uh, to breast cancer. So they understand because it, it became an issue in my then marriage. A large number of women who have breast cancer, a very high number, uh, end up with their husbands leaving them. Um, it's if a man. So you gets, also are part of those statistics. Ah, uh, there's another statistic. Very few men who go through cancer have their have wives. The same, yeah, yeah, because women tend to stick there. But um, that's I, so unfair. Yeah, but I suggest that's something we need to work with with men. I think it's, uh, it's and with ourselves as well. I also say with men, working with men, because it means that. They, I think a lot of the time with the breast cancer, the doctors only talk to the woman. There's no consideration of the, the, the man, what they're going through, their mm. fears. Whereas when a man is going through cancer, the doctors will often talk to the woman because they're seen as the person who's going to cook, who's going to look after the person. So the woman is feels included and part of the recovery. Whereas with breast cancer... Apart from the social responsibility you always feel when you are with someone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Women, but they, they, they use people. that. We, women are, are, are raised uh, yeah. to feel like that. But doctors use <clears> that. <throat> and that brings you closer. Whereas when you are the woman going through breast cancer, the man's pretty much forgotten. And he deals with whatever he deals with. And not well. But anyway, so... Um, I always said I'm, my next partner is going to be um, 
someone who lost a partner to breast cancer because even dating I'm thinking you know even though I, I, I just couldn't because how I felt okay about and my that's body. the situation yeah but I felt okay about my body but I didn't want to explain to a man I, I just didn't want that element so I I knew don't ask me how I knew I, I went to a ball a friend invited me I went said as a single woman in her late 50s I went to everything anyone asked me to <laughs> everything <laughs> I went to some of the most stupid things didn't know what people were talking about I joined clubs I joined charities working with kids in the inner New York schools I did everything and so I was at a horse charity for horses trail riding and this guy was sitting next to me and my friend was setting this guy up with another woman there and I was listening to this and I said to, you're mad how can you think he this I just didn't think they it's were for me no no I didn't I, I was not even thinking about it he was funny and what have you and this woman I just said to my friend Susan that's nothing to do I said excuse me I said to this guy you do know they're setting you up with her and he's like and I said, it's not going to work. Like, I can hear you. I can have been talking to her. You know, I was like, then we got talking and we started dancing. And I don't know how, I knew he'd lost somebody. I knew it. And he lost his beloved first wife to breast cancer. And he was a single parent of a nine-year-old and 11-year-old. He didn't date or get married again until they'd finished university. And he was just coming out of that second marriage. Um, so you knew it was perfect, perfect mar match. Well, I didn't even think of him like that. I just knew we just had a language straight away, straight away. I could say, like, I often have to wear a pressure sleeve on this arm because they took all my lymph nodes out. And I used to, if I dated, I'd never done anything with any other guy since my marriage, but I, if I went out, I'd wear something like this to cover this pressure. I was like... Yeah, you know. just just so that's well, why is that? Why yeah. 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 because you don't want to talk about you that don't want to talk mind. about it and that's oh you know and the scars and everything and he was like he just said to me I, I thought oh I'll just leave it off and he said to me why aren't you wearing your pressure sleeve I didn't even know he realized I that a that somebody knew what a pressure sleeve was that he realized they didn't have my pressure sleeve on, and that he's encouraging me to actually put it on I'm like and also somehow you understood that the the morals the the the, the, the values the ethics were the same because he yeah. was very committed with family and a single dad yeah, and, and, and then 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 probably it was yeah. a, a good starting step. yeah and he was very spiritual as well he was very, very spiritual. He, his kids who are adults used to say, I remember sent him a card on Mother's Day, happy Mother's and Father's Day and on Father's Day, happy, your, they'd no. called him my mum and my dad. And, um, well, he had he, earned that. He earned that. Yeah. So yeah, we had a lot in common and a lot of differences, but we could help each other. He had always had partners who never worked, never had work, never had a career. Um, I'd always had to take care of the men financially. He'd always had to take care of the women. Um, and so we could talk about the stresses of knowing financially everything was on your shoulders. And um, he found it exciting that I had a life outside him. He also finds it challenging but, you know, he, he sees how I come alive when I'm working. Um, and he's old enough, I mean, to, to understand that he had all that. Now yeah, why yeah, not yeah. to have an opportunity yeah. different with yeah, someone yeah, yeah. that has made her, herself uh, in such a strong way. And oh, obviously it's not, it's not bad. It's no, good well, he, always yeah. said, he, said he always said he would never... He, in his head, I, oh, well, I said... My next partner will have loved and lost someone through cancer. In his head, he said, my next partner is going to be someone who has been to the mountains, someone who has lived, because he'd been married to very sheltered, very, very wealthy women, whose daddy had done everything and then husband did everything, who didn't know, had so, many, so much money behind them that a bad day was... Uh, that they missed the sale at Bergdorf's yeah. or something. So he said, I'm always, I'm going to meet someone who has 
been to hell and managed to come back. So that because way, probably that's how he feels himself. He's, and he could have conversations about it with me. Whereas with again, you talked about hiding your emotions. When you're the one who's winning, the breadwinner, and the strong, rock, yeah. you can't say anything, yeah. and it's it's stressful. And it's not fair because life should be about sharing, oh, yeah. sharing your vulnerabilities, and yeah, real yeah. intimacy is actually that. Absolutely. But and and understanding that you have such a strong values and that for you being consistent doing what you said you should do or yeah. you will do when you knew that your dad wasn't your dad mm. how do you feel with, uh, about your mom I, I, I can't imagine how I can imagine just knowing your life superficially yeah. that that's the strongest thing you you have yeah, came it's true because yeah, yeah. it's it's my mother and you would I'm sure you would never do something like that to no. your daughter no so no. I was so, I was are you, she, are you at peace with her yeah now I am I mean she 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 passed away in 2004 and it's only after that that my who I was told was my dad I was mad sad bad for suggesting that mm. he might not be um I was angry with her because she'd made excuses not to tell me. There were always excuses, you know. Um, but then I realized she was from a very strict Catholic background. She, could, she, well, she couldn't have had an abortion. She did what she needed to do to survive. Um, she had finished with my, my stepfather. They'd split up. And she Did came. you used to call him before knew Dad, him always dad? dad, always dad. And now, is it easy for you to no. now call him stepfather? I do publicly to him, I call him dad. Okay. Because um, I guess and, we're rec and we're reconciled together as well. And th But you know what, when I discovered that, I understood. I understood why my father, I still call him my father, why he, he, he beat me. I don't say it's right. Mm. I understand the divisions in our family because he had his kids and my mother had her child. I understood why I was so different from my half sisters. My sister, I, my sisters are the same colouring as you, as you are. Yeah, I'm mixed and mixed race. Yeah, mm. and it was like I I knew, you know, I knew, and I was mad. I was breaking it up, but I understood the differences. I understood why my dad gave them everything, everything, everything which didn't help them in the end, Did still hasn't yeah. helped them. Um, and I had to fight for everything, which helped me. Um, so I understood that. And I understood with my mother the shame from a very Catholic background and her sisters in the West Indies. I understood, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I said, you know, I understand, you know, it's, uh, but it, you look back at family photographs and my sisters were always dressed in the same clothes. I was always dressed in something different. There was this competition between my my mum, uh, with me, my mum was, I was like... Overprotected? Or no? no, I was a hero. My mom, I couldn't do anything wrong. When I got my exam, she ran with my O-levels, ran it out, ah, screaming oh, like this. My dad looked at it, I, I did uh, O-levels then, I took 12, I had 11 passes. My mum was ah, running up and down the garden, screaming to the neighbors. My dad looked and said, you failed German. And it was always what I failed. Never, it never gave me a compliment, never. And when he hit me, he used to call me bastard. And I was, to him. Yeah. It was different times, I'm not excusing it. But let me just say, we have come 360 degrees. After my last divorce with my daughters, he, he's been there in a really different way. Maybe he needed to take that out of his he, chest. He did. That's why he, he, yeah. he, he absolutely... And now, now you've now, been working on it. Yeah, like, yeah. In I mean, an open, open way. And also, I mean, we'll never be... Because we're very different people, and I know there's territories to which I won't go. But he has been a rock to my children. My children are a bit like me. They say it as they see it. Um, you know, my, my younger daughter took her, her, her female partner there. And I was like, oh, no. How's this going to be? 
as you made, he's like, Mom, I can talk to Grandpa about, I said to Grandpa, can I come up with my girlfriend? And he said, yes. I said, Grandpa probably thinks you mean like when you're at school, like my Your friend. My friend. And yeah, and, and Dad said to me on the phone, oh, you know, I told them I've only got one bedroom and do they mind sharing a bed? And I went, oh, no, they would love it. <laughs> Young, you know, like. <laughs> but that's, that's good. But After it's okay. All, he accepts it. The old reward. Well, reward. she said to me, she said, "Grandpa was so good about me and my girlfriend splitting up." I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> you know, it was great because he's in his eighties now, you know, and uh, so yeah. I mean, it, it, I think our relationship started to improve when you. Uh, you're right when he could be honest. Honest and because take that. Because a lot of it, there was so much change. lying, you know, there was so much covering up and lying and... Which proved that it's the worst thing you should do ever. I agree, yeah. yeah. In any Cause rela kid knows. relationship. Because a kid you know. Yeah. And you, you know. know. Yeah. You, 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 you always knew. Yeah, children are like little animals, they can pick up all You did knew. I knew there was so... When I started doing my chat show and we did DNA tests, my mother went overly mad about it. I was like, why are you bothering for, oh, these DNA tests, you know, like, I was like, out of all the shows I've ever done in my life, you're picking on the DNA tests, you know, and I was like, and one time I, when my mum was dying, and we nursed her, she died in my arms, we nursed her at home, and I was, took the children to walk up to the shop to buy them ice cream, because my, I, it was important my children be there, and be around her bed. I, I think death, we yeah. shut off death and hide it too much. And they were there and my younger daughter helped. And it's just natural. It's, 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 mm. it's not fair, but my younger daughter helped uh, my mother plan her, her funeral, you know, everything. Yeah. So I took my children for a walk up the road to get an ice cream cone. And they looked at it and they must have been, I think they were four, what would they have been? 2004, so uh, Maddie was born in 1990, so 10 and 14. And they looked at each other those. And I said, what? And they said, mummy, don't tell us off, but while you were with Nanny downstairs, we went upstairs and we got grandpa's hairbrush and we got these hairs and maybe you can do a DNA test to find out if he's really your dad. I didn't even know they picked that up. Wow. Wow, and they are being very interested on you try, trying to push you to find your yeah, dad. Yeah, yeah. Why, why yeah. is it so important for them? What, because of their think? heritage, because of who they, they are. They want to know. They want, they want to, to know, know where they came from. Like, and do you, do you want to know? You know, I think my real father must be dead by now. And, and we ha I, I, my, my family in the West Indies is just shut down because of the shame. They, they know something, but I, I learned from my guests about looking for a missing family member and imbuing all sorts of things. And my kids do it. Maybe he's this, maybe he's that, maybe yeah. this. And so maybe he, he was just a, you know. Yeah. We maybe it's know. better to not know. Yeah. Um, from all the shows you did with real people, real problems, real mm. situations, all very true. Um, were there some that let you scars forever? That things you sometimes close your eyes and still feel the pain? Do you know, I have to say no because I, I have not allowed myself to do so because I have to look after my mental mm. health first and foremost. Um, that's not to say that I don't feel those emotions and I often would talk through with our counsellors about them. Yeah, you, know. you care, but you care oh, in a responsible way. Which yeah, and is for not the person, the... and for the person, for me and the person. Um, I prefer to remember the really amazing stories. Um, there was a guy called, I'll never forget his name, Matthew Nice, and he was very violent, very, very violent, punching and, and very aggressive, but he had awful childhood. And he was an electrician, and there was an accident, and he got a massive electric charge, burnt both his hands, and he had to have it in the burning, you know, he had to have these big bandages. The very thing he fought his way through his life, he could no longer express himself through violence. Mm. He hit the wall, he had a massive breakdown, and he came on the show, he was very suicidal, his wife brought him very suicidal, and what have you. 
I brought him a child on, Burns victim child on to talk with him. Long story short, he ended up working with Burns charities and he learned from those children, you know, and both ways. He went on to do a lot of work with charities. He got a lot of counseling. He stopped being violent. He works, he does amazing things with all sorts of groups, prisoners groups, and he reconnected. And, and a lot of the guests I've had have reconnected with me and told me how the story went, as it were. And it, I was the catalyst but they did the work. Of course, and, it's, and I, always, nobody yeah, does it for you. Yeah, you bring those people together, um, and I, those are the stories that, that... Do you still, are you still in contact with him? He will pop out the woodwork every so often to tell me what he's doing. I've had people on Instagram saying, you talked to my mother, or this one, or that one, and you helped with this, that. I still, to this day, get that. And that makes me feel really really it makes me feel really good it yeah. makes me feel so happy for those people because they took a leap of faith you know and they'll contact me and I'll always get back you know I, I, I you know even if it's just I'm so busy that it's to send a kissing emoji and saying you know or anything just to say I, I hear you so those are the things that I I choose to take on because I learned a long time ago, you cannot take on everyone's pain. It doesn't help that person. And it doesn't, it doesn't help, help you. you. No. And you cannot help either. You because you not. are just carrying the, the emotions, you're, you as well. And you're weakening yourself. Yeah. And we are getting to the end, but I cannot not ask you, how do you do to look so amazing, so vital, <laughs> so young? She's 62. 62? Trisha, really, tell us, we want to know. <laughs> um, it's mainly really, like... You look 39, oh. 39. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm watching from very close. Um, I, several things, I, lifestyle, I wear sunblock, sunblock, sunblock. Okay. I don't go out in the sun. Good one, sunblock. Yeah, gloves, gloves, sunblock. Um, I don't eat meat, I haven't eaten meat since 1980. Um, I don't know whether that's part of it or not. Um, probably, is. probably is. When I was going through breast cancer and chemotherapy, my face went like that. So I did have really slight fillers and what have you. And the same surgeon, who's a cranial surgeon, but, but, but it doesn't really show. No, no, he's hardly, you can see it. hardly anything. And I go once a year. Okay. That's all. Okay. Okay. Once let's let's just do it. Yeah. Let's just do it. But it's I, it's not just the nurse. He's a cranial surgeon because my, I had to be very careful because the the cancer. So he's a cra he he oh, okay. he's fantastic. He puts people who've been in bomb blasts and car crashes. He puts their faces back together. So it's a real special. So real special. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Only once a year. That's it. But some really, it's sunblock lifestyle, keeping fit. Strong weight training, weight with weights. All uh, women and, and do having that. a good boyfriend and doing whatever you love. For, yeah, yeah, and doing you. what feels good for you, you. For you. Thank you so much. It has been amazing and feels super honored. Thank and you. I want to give you a thank. <laughs> thank you. <gasps> thank thank, thank you. you. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you.